We're out on some call outs with the Seaworthy Service Club this morning. Uh, first stop is the beautiful Ross Niger, and I've got a little service to do on a couple of outboard engines. So let's get a cracking. It's a beautiful place. Right in the sand dunes, just near the beach. So we've got a 20 horsepower Honda, no, Tahatsu to service. I've got all the service parts in the car. Uh, I've got all my oils, consumables in there. I've got the parts in there. I've got a uh, hose pipe, but I noticed we've already got hose pipe access, which is nice. Always love it when customers do that. We've got an empty oil bottle for the engine oil. We've got an empty drip tray for the grease. Uh, for the uh, gear oil rather and we've got a couple of spare batteries for the next job that I'll be doing so first of all let's have a look at the engine I always like to do a visual inspection before I make a start of the motor just have a little look make sure there's not anything glaringly obviously bad uh, we've got a few marks on the prop prop shaft is straight the reason i do this is if there's anything shoutingly obvious then i generally will call the customer and just let them know all right okay so we've got something wrong here uh nuts loose and the steering has been disconnected The steering is nice and free so i'm guessing the customers maybe done that to grease it up over winter quite a good idea so yeah we're quite sandy uh but everything everything looks like it's there take the engine cowling off put that somewhere safe So this is a fuel injected 20 horsepower for a 300 hour service. So we're going to be doing impeller, we're going to be doing anode, spark plugs, fuel filters, oil, oil filter, checking power trim level, all that kind of thing. So I thought I'd just walk you through a few of the service jobs. I always start from the bottom and work my way up. So we test, we've run the engine, it's nice and warm, everything works perfectly. So next I'm going to do the gear oil. The gear oil was a little dirty, but nothing untoward. You always fill the gearbox from the bottom upwards so that it fills all the way up and then comes out of the oil level at the top. This is only a dinky gearbox. It takes a long time with a big gearbox. There we go. So we've got new washers on the fill screws. Replace the washer every time. I know the tendency is to think, oh, it's in good condition, so it'll do. I never do that. I always put a new one on. Okay, gear oil done. We can go back in the box. Now we'll tilt the engine and start draining the engine oil. So when doing the engine oil, you want the engine perfectly vertical. problem for draining quite so much but definitely for filling so we're gonna go 17 I think wow that was tight Okay. 
Okay, that's the last bits of engine oil out. Bill Hay Marine, Simon speaking. Hello. Okay, pretty sure it's a litre in these. Check the service manual. Okay, so we've got the MFS 20E, which is the right model. Engine oil, 1000 mil, one litre, just as we thought. One litre is here. Bang on. Tilt it up a little bit to get the last drip in. A little bit more. filter next When, when draining oil, it's really important to have a look at the condition of it as it's coming out. What I like to do is put a little bit of it on the back of my hand and just give it a little wipe around just to see if there's any little metal filings in there or anything like that. Gear oil, you will very often find a few metal filings. Um, the general rule of thumb is if you can feel the metal filings between your finger and the back of your hand, you've got a problem. If you can't feel the metal filings, it's probably okay. So long as they are not too plentiful.
this van's just a bit of a go-between actually we're just currently in the process of buying a nice four-wheel drive v-dub van that we're going to fully kit out for the service club i'm quite excited about doing that as i guess you, i guess you can imagine okay so engine engine oil filter next so next we're going to grease the prop shaft i've noticed there's a few little burrs on the propeller uh, i've got a hammer so i'll straighten those out it, there's plenty of meat left on it so it doesn't need replacing then we're going to do the impeller on the anode The right tool for the job, Simon. Taking a split pin out, you cannot beat a good pair of snips. Or some people call them side cutters. Oh, that's the wrong one. Somebody has put that in there. That is half inch drive, and these are three eighths drive. So, thank you, Melvin, for doing that. Which means I can't use my impact gun all day. Fantastic. So, when doing it the old fashioned way, you can't just undo the propeller, you've got to put something in the way. There we go. Plenty of grease on there from our last visit. That's what I like to see. It's probably George Moss that did that last one. George is no longer with us. He's not dead, don't worry. He just works for a competitor. Naughty George. So, when greasing the prop, always take the thrust washer off. If you don't take the thrust washer off, at such time as someone needs to take it off, it will be seized. Grease is your friend when using when using outboards in salt water. You literally can't use too much of it. Ah, I said I was going to straighten the prop. I don't know if you can see that, but it's just slightly bent. So let's find something we can tap it against. You need to find something that's just about the right radius of bend. There we go, that feels nice. Just take off the burrs. So 
amazing how much friction, turbulence should I say, is created with a prop that's not smooth. So if you've got a prop with a load of burrs on it, make sure you smooth it off if you're not going to replace it obviously. New split pin and then an old. There are lots of different anodes on the market but we found that the best ones are Marta anodes they're the best at sacrifice, sacrificing their sacrificialness This one's in quite good order, but uh, we'll change it out anyway. Belt and braces. Get rid of all the salty bits. So it's got a good electrical connection to the rest of the engine. The way that a sacrificial anode works is that zinc is higher in the galvanic table than aluminium. I think it's higher, I'm pretty sure it's higher. Someone comment, let me know whether I'm right or not. Uh, higher in the galvanic table than aluminium. So as the aluminium rusts, it gives up electrons. And as it does that, the electrons from the magnesium are given up more readily than the electrons from the, al from the aluminium. So an electric current basically is created and the electrons pass into the aluminium, therefore the aluminium doesn't oxi oxidise and the anode does. I'm here with a lovely lovely young chap, Mike Ingle. He's been coming to Ross for just... Since 37? 39. 1939. He's yeah. promised me he'll decide whether he likes it or not quite soon. <laughs> uh, and I was just asking Mike uh, how Ross has changed over the years. Um it's built up enormously and uh, we started off staying at a farm uh, plus Langwiffen uh, out on the headland um, we've had got the same people that we've known for well 40 50 years come every year and uh, we lived here in a house my parents retired here eventually and uh, we just love it. Um, we've had boats, sailing boats, rowing boats. I learned to sail on the beach. Uh, a friend of mine was given a dinghy. We took it out to sea, sailing dinghy. No life jackets. <laughs> just <laughs> got on with it. And, uh, we just love the place. And uh, we, I've driven 400 miles to get here a couple of days ago. And I should drive back. And, uh, it's a marvellous place. Yeah, it's certainly got a special feel to it, hasn't it? It has, yes. So and we're outside David Way's residence, and he's uh, 94. <laughs> Still going strong. With a snapper. <laughs> yeah. 
we meet in the pub as soon as we get down here. He's great. And, uh, the village itself has obviously built up. There's been enormous building and some an awful lot of money coming here because it is very, very popular. Yeah. Um, we used to have two butchers, greengrocer, and all that sort of thing. We've got one shop now. Yeah. Mm, yeah. That's a way of life. Supermarkets have killed it yeah, all. Yeah, they have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and were there the carnals here when you first? Oh, yes. Carnals were here and they we rode their horses and that sort of thing. Yes. Um, my, my son's um, girlfriend is Emily Carnal. Oh, right. So he yeah. spends most of his time up here now. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, he's, he's pretty much flown the nest, I think. Oh, my God. <laughs> I think yes. he's loving the Ross, yeah. Ni Ross Niger air. Or it yeah. might not be the Ross Niger air. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a lot of that about in the Sandhills. <laughs> Charles, if you're watching this, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lovely. Well, thank you very much for telling me about uh, about your time. And so you you say that lots of money's been spent here. What did the what did the high street look like? Um, the high street's not changed a lot, but um, off the high street, round the back and that, there's huge houses, and uh, the seafront's changed quite a bit with big houses. Yeah, but. Uh, there was a hotel, the Bay Hotel was here. And was that on the front? No, that was uh, down towards, well, down towards the beach. It was close to the front. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Past the Sandy Mount? Oh, past the Sandy Mount. It was beyond uh, uh, Palethorpe's Castle. Right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's just grown as people love it. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And I, I must know mm, probably 50, 60 people yeah. here. And uh, yeah, it's got a lovely you, community spirit, hasn't it? It has, yeah, yeah. yeah. And well, the Sandy Mount's made a big difference as well, yeah. as a sort of focal point. Although yeah. it was always there as a drinking club, because of course you weren't allowed to drink on Sundays. Okay. Uh, and then. How did you get by? They opened a club. Oh, there you, go. <laughs> yeah. you couldn't go into a pub on a Sunday, right. but it was a club. It was safe. Yeah. Ways and means. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And what do you think of the the large buildings that have that have come up on the on the beach? Do you like them? Um, not particularly. Um, it's okay, but um, it has spoiled a bit of the atmosphere. But it's inevitable I think everywhere. So, yeah. I mean, where I live down uh, on the south coast, the same thing happens. Yeah, they find a nice place and they want to buy into it, yeah. and they change it and they yeah. develop it. But I suppose spending in the local community, he, it's at, good. Anglesey yeah. is one of the one of the poorest shires in I the know. whole of Great Britain. So yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, but it it all helps, and uh, um, everybody contributes uh, what they can. Yeah, uh, um, and uh, David's been very good. He uh, always has has supported the thing. Golf club has developed a lot. Uh, 1946, I joined the golf club. <laughs> you still, Cost me two and sixpence, yeah. <laughs> you still own your, your pings? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is yeah. that what they call golf clubs, pings? I don't yeah, know. Ping, ping clubs, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. yeah I, I still try and play. Yeah? Badly. Good on you. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I got, I got away with golf. All of my family love playing golf. Yeah. And um, me being more of a countryman, all I could be bothered doing was trying to find golf club golf balls yeah. because I knew that they were worth two pounds in the golf club. <laughs> so when I was like this yeah. sort of size, I'd just so be scoring around in the bush. That's good. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. So uh, who was it that said golf's a waste of a good work walk? Was it? Um, it was one of the. Uh, it was a writer, wasn't it? It was a writer. Hemingway, I think. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, it could have been. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, but you don't feel that. You know, way. if you can still play it. Maybe seven. Good for you. Yeah, yeah. fair play. Full yeah. full eighteen holes. Mm, on a truck, yeah. <laughs> you know, a little uh, buggy. Yeah, walking's a bit of a problem. Get pulled into the into the clubhouse. At, oh, after nine. that's <laughs> essential. <laughs> essential. Yes. Oh, good on you. Yeah. Well, it's been really nice to talk to you. And thank you very much. What for a your good time. company you are. Such good communicators. You've set up this organisation, it's brilliant. Oh, that's super of you to say, yeah, Tom. Thank yeah. you for the kind words. We, we've not, not found many companies as um, 
helpful as you lot. Oh, yeah. lovely. Well, yeah. I wasn't expecting that, but I'm blushing. No, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank well, you. Well, I can recommend it. Yeah. Oh, good for you. Well, please do. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Yeah. All right, let's get on with this service. Yeah. Impala next. So, first, separate the shift shaft. When lifting the impeller cup, make sure you don't lose the key. Some impeller kits have a, a key with them, but lots don't, so if you lose that, you're scuppered. Now, when you're inspecting an impeller, to see if you've got a fault, for instance, to see whether it was the impeller that was at fault, these ridges that you can see here, Two of the things that people don't look at. See that one slightly burnt? That was probably from running it out of water. The other thing that people don't look at is for a ridge just here. If there's a ridge there and this bit is burnt, then that's almost certainly going to be your lack of water pressure. Same on the uh, water pump base plate. Feel with your finger, see if there's a ridge. There is no ridge, so the cup and the base plate are both fine, they don't need changing, but the impeller definitely does. A lot of people would look at that and think it's perfect, but it ain't. There's a nice new impeller. Now, you can add a little bit of grease into the water pump body, however, I would just give a word of caution, and that is, if you add too much, that will actually stop the engine from pumping water. So, just be cautious when you do that. We're going to whip this key out and put a bit of grease on there. Because they do seize from time to time. Everything else looks good. It's nice and clean in there. So, we're going to pop the impeller on. And the pump housing now it won't just fit on like that what you have to do turn the splines turn the shaft while you push down and then it will just drop on perfect lots and lots of grease Can't have too much.
I use a nut gun all the time, but I like to finish everything off just by hand. So I know it's at the right torque. Grease the splines of the drive shaft. Try not to get grease on top because that just compresses. And a little bit in the water pipe hole. Have a look up there, make sure everything's good. Stop a little bit on the dowels. that it went on quite easily sometimes well, most often than not actually if you don't get the uh, splines to meet quite nicely and mesh on the uh, on the drive shaft to the crankshaft then you just sometimes have to turn the propeller a little bit to get them to get them to mate we were lucky that time Richard says he's uh, organised the finance through a, an annual tea or something. Yeah, so it's it's the the new initiative that we started, the service yeah. club. Yeah. Uh, it's just designed to spot problems before they arise. Yeah. Like make the the repair pre rather than post breakdown, mm -hmm. and also to make it completely hassle free for you guys. So we come to you, yeah. and it all goes on in the background. And we even throw a winterization in at the end of each season. Good. Right. I'll be back and uh, I'll put that uh, hose away. You need to worry about that. Are you sure? Yeah. That's very good of you. But you'll be another, what, half an hour? Tonight. I'll be 45 minutes, I would say, something like that. Okay. Maybe three quarters, maybe an hour. Okay, see you in a bit. Now, gear shift. So, when setting up the gear shift, you've got to make sure that the control box is in the same gear as the gearbox. Now, at the moment, as you can see, they are not in the same gear. So, this engine has got a very positive neutral detent. So we can be confident that that's in neutral. We know the gearbox is in neutral. Right in the middle of its movement. So we should, in theory, be able to just offer this screw up and start screwing it down with no bias toward either forward or reverse but first <laughs> I need to remember the locking nut don't I silly boy So we can now be confident that that engine will be getting exactly the same amount of reverse as it is doing forward. Now possibly the most satisfying part of the job, packing the midsection with grease. Oh, you can see it coming out there, look. Oh, nice. Satisfying. And listen to this creaking and splattering as the last of the salty water and 
air comes out the top of the midsection nice so that swivel pin is greased next we're going to grease the tilt tube and then after that we will be greasing the steering cable Noises, lovely noises. So, when greasing the steering cable, you want it all the way out. to get as much grease as we possibly can onto this cable and inside this tube. And I'll show you a really nice little trick that my dad showed me a lot of years ago of how to pack some, some grease into the actual inner of the cable which is where it needs to get to so we've got a good few cc's of grease there we allow it to go back see if i can get any little bit more in I haven't brought a 29mm spanner, so excuse me for being a heathen. These steering cable nuts are nylock, so they've got a nylon locking bit in them. So just bear in mind when you get to what feels like the end of the thread, you're not quite there, you need to go a little bit further just to engage the locking part. So we'll get rid of the excess grease and then I'll show you what our endeavours getting all the grease in will actually do. So you can imagine that tube is full of grease now. So what we're going to do is we're going to push the steering ram back in and that in turn will shove a load of grease down here. So it's easy up to there, and now it's gone stiff. Oh, as we are packing the grease into where it needs to go. Oosh. So that's just prolonged the length of that steering cable by about five years compared to if you didn't do it. All right, let's knit this up. 14 mil. Pop a bit of grease down here as well. Ah, look, you can see all the grease has started to come through here. Oh, that is so nice. And listen to it. Oh, yeah. Oh, so good. So we don't need to put any grease in there. Really nice. It's worth spray grease. It's the best stuff that you can get. This is the 
tilt lock mechanism. So this spray grease is very, very searching. It goes on dead thin, but then set, sets rock hard. Uh, not rock hard, sets really sticky. Okay, just make sure that actuates well. Yes, it does. All right, I'm happy. So we've got a new oil filter and everything below is done. So now let's change the spark plugs. When you're changing spark plugs, it's really important to have a look, visual inspection of the plug tip to give you an idea of the running condition of the engine. That's perfect. So you want blackening around here, clean on the electrode, and no bits of grey. Bits of grey are very, very bad news in a combustion chamber. That means that you've got piston damage. Hope you never see that. I've seen it a lot. We were doing an old Chrysler once and there were actually pieces of piston stuck to the uh, stuck to the spark plug. The less said about Chryslers the better. My dad used to absolutely love them. Never really understood that. Just a little dab of grease on the spark plug thread. Just makes the whole job a bit easier. Spark plugs have a crush ring on them, this little bit here. So always just nip them onto the crush ring. Spark plugs do not need to be winched down tight. Totally unnecessary. Just get it till you hit the crush ring and then another half turn and that's fine. So that's the crush ring, another half turn, fine. Crush ring, another half turn, fine. Okay, so we'll replace the fuel filter and then we'll grease, spray grease all the moving parts and electrical bits, give it one last test run and then we're good to go. When inspecting or changing the fuel filter element on an engine like this, you've got a red disc. Now that red disc is heavier than fuel and lighter than water so if it's sitting up here then you've got water in your engine tank which will need a dressing this one's sitting right low down and i can't see any muck uh, but we're going to do it anyway get my little oil catcher Save the turtles. Okay, so what we're going to do, we need to have a look in here to see if there's any muck. So I'm just going to pour the fuel out slowly to see if there's any crud in there. No, that's perfectly clean. But we'll just give it a quick spray out with carb cleaner anyway. Belt and braces. Tiny little bit of grease around here because these do seize up for fun, strangely enough. Just plastic on plastic, but they do. Okay, new fuel filter fitted. Okay, looks good. Prime the bulb. Make sure we've got no leaks. We don't. Okay, give the engine a run while I put some storage seal on the metal bits, anywhere there's corrosion, and then grease on the moving parts. 
We need some water for that. Check the starting gear protection, check the power tilt trim. Okay, that engine's done. So I hope you enjoyed that video. I enjoyed making it. Uh, I'm off to my next service now. If you are interested in the Seaworthy Service Club, then uh, get in touch with us. We cover all of North Wales, pretty much Anglesey, Gwynedd, down the lane. Uh, so if you've got a situation where you struggle to get to your local engineer and they don't do call out or if you don't have a local engineer or if you have a local engineer who's not that good then we can help you get in touch <laughs>